another edition of the Public Interest. My name is David Granger. And on this series of programs, we examine issues which are of interest to all Guyanese at home and in the diaspora. And uh, today I would like to deal with a question that I've dealt with so frequently in the past. And that is, I asked myself the question, is Guyana a violent country? And also, where does violence come from? And what causes the violence in Guyana? And over the months, if you've been following this program, I've dealt with 10 types of, of violence. I've dealt with civil violence, criminal violence, cultural violence, domestic violence. And these are matters of concern to a lot of Guyanese. I've dealt with violence on the frontier. I've dealt with gang violence, including violence in schools. I've dealt with neglect as a form of violence. I've dealt with psychological violence. I've dealt with sexual violence. I've dealt with verbal violence, um, calling attention to the, the Babu John orations. So, I mean, this is just on this program, public interest. I've dealt with 10 types of violence. But where does this violence come from? In my experience, I feel that one of the, the most um, important contributory factors was the disturbance that we had in this country in 1964. Next year will be the 60th anniversary. But it is my view that the disturbances had a lingering effect, what I call a secondary impact. Not only were houses burned or, or, or people murdered, but over the years, we've been unable to get over the trauma of the disturbances of 1964. And those of us who were around during the troubles would see that the PBB had not really changed from 1964 to 2004, that we still saw the same type of terrorism being supported by people who were in government and who should be protecting the citizens. That is why in my research, I keep going back to the disturbances of 1964. Many persons, many of you listening may not have been around in 1964. And maybe you don't have a clear understanding of what took place. But I feel that the disturbances in that year were, were pivotal in everything that happened afterwards. They still condition the, 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 the behavior of people at Linden, and on the coast, the West Coast Demerara. Those disturbances arose out of a political problem, and that is one that we must deal with. It is a problem of political representation. In theory, it was settled when the leaders of the PNC, Fort Burnham, PPP, Cherry Jagan, and then United Force, um, Peter de Gare, went up to London and they signed an agreement uh, on the 25th of October, 1963, is before, the year before 64, of course, authorizing the British government to impose a solution to resolve this political impasse. Now, there are two main systems. One is PR, which all of us have grown up now to accept as the system for ensuring the fairest representation of people in parliament. All it means is that if you get, you know, 48% of the votes, you get 48% of the seats in the National Assembly. Before that, we had the first pass, the post system, which meant that whoever, whichever candidate got the majority in a constituency, he would or she would go to the National Assembly. And of course, it, it, it was quite silly because somebody with 20 or 22 percent or 28 percent of the vote who got more than somebody 27 or 26 or all of the others could end up representing that constituency. So it meant that we could have a minority government. And this is exactly what happened in 1957 and 1961, in which the PPP actually won, you know, um, uh, about 42% of the seats and got 58%, 42% uh, of the vote and got 58% of the seats. But the PNC and United Force together got 58% of the vote and got 42% of the seats, something 
the arithmetic, you know, something was quite wrong with that crazy arithmetic. And much of the time between 1961 and 1964 was taken up with getting a peer system. And this is what it was all about. The FPP first passed the post system was regarded as unfair. And the PR system was regarded as fair. And when the British imposed the PR system in 1964, all hell broke loose, literally. What did what the PPP did, uh, of course, um, when Dr. Jagan signed and came back to Guyana, his party, um, I don't want to mention persons in the party, his party is angry. And he himself launched what is called a hurricane of protest. And in order to give that hurricane of protest the aura of respectability, if you want to call it that, a strike was called by the Guyana Agriculture Workers Union, GAU. And the purpose of the strike, in theory, was to demand that the Sugar Producers Association, remember those days, the entire sugar industry was out there, the British. The purpose of the strike was to demand recognition for GAU. At that time, another union called the Manpower Citizens Association, MPCA, was representative of all of the sugar workers. So that strike was called um, in the sugar industry in, in uh, February 1964. And it lasted 165 days. And during that period, over 160, 176 people officially were murdered between the start of the strike, GAU strike, in, 19, in uh, February 1964, and the time it ended in July 1964. Simply, since MPCA was the representative union, many workers did not go on strike. And GAU started to attack many of the workers who did not go on strike. Well, they couldn't call it strike because they were not recognized. And it turned out that many of the workers were of African descent. So what started off as an apparent industrial dispute became a racial dispute, especially on the West Coast. But it also affected other areas of the sugar belt. And on the quarantine, which is far away from Leonora and the West Coast, the first person to be killed by a bomb in the Gao strike of 1964 on the 4th of March was a man called Edgar Munro from the village of Manchester. And later on, as a result of the same bombing, another person called Ramraj Gunraj um, was also killed. So the disturbances, the murders started with a grim but balanced hit between one African and one Indian. But the bomb was not thrown into the truck carrying the workers. They picked up the workers from Manchester, and when they reached Tain Village, the bomb went off. The bomb was planted. The bomb was made by a terrorist of Gawu. On another occasion, we will deal with the murders and the bombings and the arson and so on. But right now, I just want you to know that the first person to die in 1964 was um, Edgar Monroe, uh, the cousin of, of um, Mr. Alan Monroe from the quarantine from Manchester Village. And um, his memorial is in the uh, Auckland Churchyard at St. Saviour's uh, Presbyterian Churchyard in Auckland, opposite the Auckland um, School. Now, from the time the strike called, was called, and from the time the violence started by the Gao, not a day passed in which there was not some form of violence, of arson. Sometimes you just see the sky glowing red because Gao is burning the sugar estates. There was battery, there was bombing, there was murder, there was mutilation and rape. This was not the work of the PNC. This is the work of the Guyana Agriculture Workers Union. 
And I must say that it took Mr. Sidney King, now AOC Koyana, and the African Society for Cultural Relations of Independent Africans, the call to demand that the British governor, Richard Late, um, should declare a state of emergency because people are being killed in West Devon on a daily basis. And the, the government, which is a PPP government, refused to call a state of emergency. And Mr. King, Mr. Koyana, had to sit down in front of Guyana of State, what is now State House, it was then called Government House demanding that there should be a state of emergency so troops could be called out to protect the people, the victims. And of course, during that, um, during the disturbances, there were a lot of massacres. And uh, when you use massacre, my friends, massacre is a technical term, by, you know, one person can be massacred, two persons can be massacred. A massacre is, is, is the murder of about four persons at least in one place at the same time. So there was an atrocity at Wismore, which should be condemned. Um, but it wasn't a massacre. It was an atrocity. A lot of people were, were a lot of houses were burnt, and, um, and three, two or three people were killed. But it was not a massacre. There's no such thing as Wismore massacre. What was a massacre? What was a massacre? is the burning to death of the Abraham family uh, um, in, on the 12th of June, 1964. That was a massacre. What was a massacre was the bombing of the uh, San Chapman launch at Toradaya in the Demerara River on the 6th of July. That was a massacre. You know, Chetty Jagger in his book, The Western Trial, said the people drunk. Can you imagine? 53 people drunk? No, they were blasted to death. And you can read the accounts of the survivors, how they had to swim through this river of blood, piece of flesh and bone uh, at, at Toradaya. And um, this is what was taking place in 1964. And it was only after, it was only after the massacre of the Abraham family on the 12th of June, and remember this, 12th of June, um, that the governor, Sir Richard Late, finally used his emergency powers. And within 24 hours, within 24 hours, he arrested 32 members of the PPP, um, including the deputy premier, Mr. Brindley Ben. Um, uh, and they were detained in Mazaruni. There's a special section called Sibley Hall where these uh, two persons were, were detained without trial. And um, three members of the PNC were detained, 32 members of the PPP. So the governor, the British government and the special branch and the uh, British Guiana police force knew who were the people behind um, the the, the violence at that time. I said 176 people were killed in less than five months. So eventually on the, in, in July, 1964, the strike came to an end. And Dr. Cherry Jagan again in the Western trial admitted that when the strike ended, the disturbances ended. It wasn't quite true, but in his own mind, he linked the strike and the murders with, uh, with the whole um, period of disturbances between February and July, 1964. The two were inseparable. PPP and Gawu were inseparable. And strike and murders, inseparable. So there we have the nexus. My friends, let me say this. The violence in the disturbances was not spontaneous. It was not random. It was deliberate. It was organized. It was well executed. It was directed by the People's Progressive Party. It proceeded because there was mobilization of members of the PYO, the Progressive Youth Organization. In those days, the three main parties had the youth arms. 
PPP had the Progressive Youth Organization. The United Force had the Guyana United Youth Society, GUIS. And the PNC had what was then called um, the YSM, the Young Socialist Movement. Well, that was, you know, in you know, nearly 60 years ago. But the terrorists were trained. The weapons were supplied from, we don't make weapons in there. These are machine guns um, and automatic rifles. Um, a study was done, and the study found that the PYO was largely responsible for the violence. And let me quote, in 1962 alone, at least 110, 110 members of the PYO were sent overseas to communist countries for training. Many of them went to Cuba. And we know the name of the training school in Cuba, where they were sent. More than 200 persons were sent to Cuba altogether. This started in 1962. It wasn't a reaction. It was preemptive. It wasn't a reaction to any strike or any disturbance. They sent people to be trained in Cuba even before the disturbances started. In other words, they sent people to be trained to direct the disturbances. And they also had training schools here in Guyana, in the back dams. So what we saw was not an accident. At the same time, Cuba had associated itself or aligned itself to the Soviet bloc. So it was changing from the American National Guard type weapons, the Tommy guns and the, and the, uh, the rifles that they used in the Second World War. And they were adopting the Soviet style weapons, which everybody knows now. They call them the AK-47. So they had a lot of excess weapons. And these weapons found their way into Guyana. And these weapons were used by PYO terrorists to kill fellow Guyanese. And if you go back to the papers in the magazines of 1964, you'll see photographs of these belts of ammunition. And you'll see pictures of the weapons that were used. It was no secret. It was no secret. And we know that we have all suffered because of that violence. Now, what was the purpose of the violence? I said it was not random. The PPP, as early as January 1964, decided that they were not going to allow the elections to take place under the proportional representation system. Why? Because they feared that they would lose the majority. Um, they wanted elections based on the demographic data that they had accumulated. They wanted the elections to remain on the constituency system in which you can have, for example, a group of villages. As long as their candidate got the majority, you would carry the whole constituency. Even if, as I said, you know, 72 percent voted for for various other parties, and they only won 22 percent, 28 percent, they had win the whole constituency. So, in fact, in 1957 and 1961, the PPP technically was a minority government, and that is why the PPP refused to accept or to acknowledge that the PR system could work. But we all know in Guyana that. Since 1964, you know, for the last, what, 59 years, we have had a PR system. Um, it has some difficulties, but that is the system that we have. So the whole purpose of the PPP campaign, this hurricane of protest, the disturbances, the violence, was to prevent the holding of PR elections, which were finally held in December. They failed because the British deployed regiment after regiment to keep the peace. In fact, between 1953 and 1964, there were 18 British regiments based in what was then British Guyana. 18 regiments came 
um, to this country uh, over that period, that 11-year uh, period, 1953 to 1964, because of the instability created by the People's Progressive Party. And they are sworn to prevent elections so, because they were elected under the FPP, first past the post system, in August um, uh, 1961. And so they felt that the tour of duty should have gone um, at least for four years until August 1965. And that is another reason why they fought, because they felt that the term was being shortened by the British government. In those days, the British government issued orders by order in council. This is not something to debate in the National Assembly and the Legislative Council. Order in council. The Queen set up the Special Service Unit by order in council, nothing to debate. That is how the colony functions. So the PPP literally tried by force, weapons, murder, arson, sabotage, to prevent the holding of elections in December 1964. And you know what happened. Of course, the elections were held. The combined seats of the People's National Congress and United Force um, was a majority in what was later to become the National Assembly, at that time it was called the Legislative Assembly, and uh, it meant that the PPP policy of hurricane of protest failed. And um, at least for the first time in several years, the Guyanese were able to breathe a sigh of relief as the coalition administration uh, took office. And, and this, I can tell you this, having gone into office in 19, in 2015, I can imagine the task Mr. Burnham had in 1964 to clean up the mess of the PPP. And I had the same task in 1964, in 19, in 2015, to clean up the mess of the, the PPP. So that is what it was all about. So the disturbances failed, but even after the elections of December 1964, the violence continued because you had a lot of PYO cars running around the country with bombs and, and, and weapons. Um, and they were trained in sabotage. And the people who tr had them trained did not tell them to stop. It's all over. They just kept on keeping on. And well into 1965, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of sabotage. Cane fields were still being burned. A lot of religious places, schools and churches. Those days you still had church schools were being burnt um, by the PPP. Bombs were exploding. Even the United States consulate, at that time they didn't have an embassy on Main Street, was bombed <laughs> by the PPP. You thought it was easy? No, no, it was not easy. If educational facilities, infrastructure uh, was bombed, Every here and there, you you come you, you came across some cache of uh, weapons or arms and ammunition, explosives. More important, my friends, is that PPP defectors, people who were just recruited by the PPP and sent overseas to be trained, had started to speak out. They started to say, hey, I wanted to become an electrician. I wanted to become an engineer. That's what I was told. But instead, I was being trained to make bombs and uh, conduct sabotage and foment something called rebel revolution in Guyana. You see, the PPP might have told the Cubans they wanted to have this communist revolution. But in fact, it was um, an attempt to dominate the population of Guyana with a small cadre of, of, um, of people in the PPP. Whether they were communists or not, I don't know. That's not communism. That is uh, tyranny. And many of the, many of the persons they sent to be trained um, in Cuba spoke out afterwards. Unfortunately, there was one called <laughs> Akbar Ali. I think he's on quarantine. No relation to any other Ali. But Akbar Ali publicly said in December 1965, that he had been trained in bomb making and sabotage, and that is not what he wanted to do. Uh, he said that the PPP was getting money from communist countries to support the overthrow of the government, which was elected in 1964, and to impose communism 
you know. So that is what the Cold War was about, you know. The Cold Warriors were supporting the People's Progressive Party to set up a Soviet-style republic in, in, in Guyana. But um, 90 days after, after Ali's declaration, um, he was murdered. And that was the last declaration we had from any of those PYO cadres. After Akbar Ali he was murdered, nobody else spoke out. Everybody else kept quiet. And a lot of people, a lot of people were trained, you know, and they're still around. But they were all quiet after Akbar Ali came to a sudden death. I think he's on the quarantine. The question for us today, we who have gone through these trials and tribulations, we who have suffered, we who are children and descendants of people who were killed, in the disturbances of 1964. Although some of us didn't witness those disturbances. Where do we go from here? What is the way forward? Do we go on fighting among ourselves? Do we continue to hate each other? Do we train people in weapons? And do we train people to you know, um, create violence uh, like we had during the troubles um, between 2000 and, and 2010? My friends, it is my view that it will take time to heal the wounds of the disturbances. We haven't, we haven't healed as yet. And that is why we still have mistaken people on one side who think they could recreate the disturbances, to use violence to dominate the rest of the population. And that is why we, who are descendants of the victims, must be careful not to allow ourselves to be dominated again. Violence is not a necessity. <laughs> violence is not a social necessity. It is not a, a political inevitability. <laughs> violence could be avoided. Violence is not necessary. Violence is something human beings invent to dominate other groups. Violence is a social invention. And we need, as a country, as a community, as a collective, to craft a way forward to avoid going back into that cave, that pit of, 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 of destructive violence that we had in 1964. What do we do? First of all, you will now understand better why when I went into office in 2015, one of the first things I did in 2015 was to launch a program and appoint a minister responsible for social cohesion. The big problem in Guyana is not oil and gas. It is bringing the nation together so that when the oil and gas profits come, we can share the profits equitably. So social cohesion, this is what the PP rejected. This is what Mr. Jagdo called a farce. Social cohesion is at the heart, the core of getting moving Guyana forward. And by social cohesion, by respecting each other, we will learn to reduce the inequality between communities and also between the hinterland and the coastland. And I think we had some good lessons about the way people in the hinterland have been treated. And unless we have this concept of cohesion and realize that all persons Africans, Amerindians, Indians, mixed peoples, Chinese, Portuguese, all Guyanese are entitled to the same benefits. And they're not to be treated as insiders or outsiders. So the first thing is to ensure or to encourage real social cohesion. And it's a pity that the PPP has just discarded social cohesion as if it's irrelevant. The second requirement is that we should ensure there's universal primary and secondary education so that Guyanese could have a, a real understanding of our social history, what we went through. So we don't have to invent the wheel all over again. We don't have to make those mistakes that were made 60 years ago by the leaders of, of, of that time. And it is education 
And the education doesn't come from the pages of, of, of the Guyana Times or any, any newspaper. Uh, education comes from a proper understanding of what the experiences of our people are. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people don't understand what we went through. A third requirement is that our local government system must empower uh, neighborhood democratic councils. LGE is not a matter of victory and defeat. It's not a matter of domination. It's not a matter of capturing strongholds. Local government elections is a matter of bringing people in a community together to sit around the table. What do we need for Hawkstyle Lancaster? What do we need for um, Irang Sawariwa? What do we need for Kaichum? What do we need in the municipalities in Mabaruma, Madi, or Lethem, uh, and Bartico? Let us sit around the table and consult and communicate with one another, collaborate for the good of the community. This question of domination is going to destroy democracy. And that is why we must be careful. So NDCs, the grassroots level, municipalities must be empowered to ensure that we don't turn on one another. And one of these days when you read and hear about what took place in the disturbances, you see our neighbors, neighbors, you know, were encouraged to fight against one another for the sake of the so-called PR elections or um, hurricane of protest. And we must also bear in mind the impact of youth on youth. That is, many of the youth uh, in our country were unemployed. And that is why the PPP found it so easy to recruit people, um, including a lot of Africans and Indians, to send them overseas to be trained. If people were properly employed and given good jobs, not these, you know, forty dollars a month jobs, but given proper employment, we would not have this type of social problem. But when we have a government that is based on our basis of social policy and handouts and part-time jobs, we are going to have a continuing social problem, a problem of unemployment and a problem of alienation. My friends, I cannot tell you everything that happened in the disturbances of 1964. Maybe in future programs, we could look at some of the more grim, grave, unsavory aspects of that terrible period. It's not a question of just blaming the PPP, but you must understand that the PPP, as long as it does not change its mindset and sets out to dominate other communities, you will always create the conditions for um, for the disturbances and disorder, like we had between 2000 and 2010. People make the nation, not oil and gas, not big buildings, not stadiums, not airports. People make the nation. And all people now are still suffering from the secondary impact of the violence that they witnessed during the disturbances in 1964. Communities are still divided. People have been wounded by the, 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 the murders and the bombings. Victims of the stoning of the school bus on the 6th of March, 2020. Believe me, those children, <laughs> those secondary school children, 13, 14, and 15 years old, who were stoned on, this, on the 6th of March, um, just four days after the elections in 2020. That is what they remember in West Coast Babies, that they were in a school bus at midday on a Friday, and people who they thought were their neighbors were throwing stones at them. Violence leaves a long, painful impact. And the disturbances of 1964 have wounded this country deeply. We all have a collective duty and responsibility to overcome what I call, you know, the, 
the pains uh, and the pangs of the wounds of uh, the disturbances of 1964. There's no place for violence in this country. People deserve a good life. People deserve good government. People deserve peace, social cohesion, and tranquility. May God bless you all. Each man must